people who are embedded in networks of friendships aren't afraid, <laughs> right? Like they're not alone. They're not desperate. They're not anxious. They, they feel secure. They have a place they love. Um, and that means that they have a place that they're willing to defend, right? That they'll stand up for. So therefore they have courage, right? And all these, all of these traits make them um, insusceptible to the kind of rule that tyrants, um, to tyrants advance. Join the best in the movement. It's Conservative Conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Tom Sarouf and joined today by Dr. Andrew Willard-Jones, who is a professor at the Franciscan University of Steubenville, and he is a fellow, another honors conference professor. So Dr. Jones, great to have you with us. Great to have you with me. Glad to be talking with you. Hello, Tom. Thanks for having me. Starting off, um, who are you? Where do you come from? <laughs> what sort of work do you do? Things of that sort. Tell us, tell me, myself, and your listeners more about yourself on a personal note. Sure. So, um, well, I say I grew up outside of Seattle, Washington, Western Washington, um, yeah, from a very, uh, a very like Cold Warrior family. We were Reagan, Reagan conservatives, and uh, if it was every everything was about how the communists were evil, and so my whole life started out from the very beginning with that sort of a that sort of a, a an orientation from from childhood, and so it was appropriate that um, when it time when time to go to college, I went to Hillsdale in Michigan and um, studied history there and uh, economics and then um, and then then that's really where I also uh, discovered the Catholic Church and so in, in, and went into became became Catholic which then became um, an incredibly important part of my whole intellectual uh, journey of course and, and life as a whole so that's a major sort of event for me and then um, met my wife Sarah there at Hillsdale as well and um, and then went on to grad school to study medieval history, modern history, um, uh, political theory. And so I, I'm a sort of an odd um, medievalist. I'm a, uh, my specialty is the mid Middle Ages, but that within that specialty, my real obsession is um, political theology, um, political theory, and um, how uh, Christendom operated and thought of itself and understood itself what its worldview was and then also its actual structures and then how that um how that destroyed itself and turned into the modern world <laughs> okay so so basically that transition from from the medieval to the modern is something i'm very interested in um and now i'm actually becoming more interested in the transition from the pagan to the medieval so i'm kind of going backwards in my studies um so I live, like you said, I, I work at Franciscan in Steubenville, where I teach in the philosophy department. I teach mostly political philosophy and then also history. And um, I live here with my wife and we have 10 kids. So we have a huge family and that takes a lot of time. Um, I would imagine. Of yeah, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's worth it, I guess. That's Delightful, what I'm it sounds like, too. It's, yeah, that's... it's actually it's actually pretty cool. And um what else? What else? So I, I'm one of the founders of an outfit called New Polity uh, here in Steubenville, and it's a group, a, a kind of a think tank. We have a magazine, we have a podcast, that kind of thing, and um, where we are attempting to to really rethink the political, um, the framework for politics. So the, the, how, how we understand the political space, how we understand what's going on, um, and 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 then also actually take action. So there's two sort of sides, the theoretical side and a practical side. I I'm only, mainly work on the theoretical side and then just sort of do what the practical side people tell me to do. But so far <laughs> that's worked out pretty well <laughs> here in Steubenville. So that's it. I'm very involved in, um, you know, I'm very involved. My, my research at this point is very involved in sort of post-liberal politics, um, political theory, political theology with um, an emphasis on on reaching back to the Middle Ages and and trying to um, bring some of the concepts or some of the things we can learn forward. So I, I guess Excellent. that's it. That's that's my Excellent. That's my yeah. I mean, and right before I hit the record button, I told you you're the first person actually, and this is was surprising to me, um, given you know who's at ISI and sort of our affiliation or friendships with um, you know yeah. you and Mark and Jacob at, at New Polity. Um, but you're our first New Polity guest. So actually, instead of starting with sort of you know, this sort of series that we're doing where we're talking with all of the honors faculty about what they're going to yeah. be talking about and sort of doing the uh, was the look under the hood. I want to start asking you, I mean, 
what is the sort of how do you guys understand where we are now politically that you want to rethink so what's like what's the starting point from which you've gotten to here's what we need here's why we need to rethink and moving back towards reincorporating and recovering a sort of medieval christian 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 christocentric ah, perspective nice. on politics i'm glad you pulled that word out that was hard um yeah um i think what uh, well, I know what happened, what happened to me and, and, and Mark, Jacob, all of us here and a lot, so many others is the dissatisfaction with the status quo. I mean, it, and 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 um, the crisis, the political crisis that we that everyone knows we're in the social crisis. We can feel it in the air. Even the people who can't articulate it know that there's some impending doom, right? Like this isn't going to keep going on like this. Something is deeply wrong. And one of the things that became very apparent to me was that the categories, the, the way in which we think about the political wasn't adequate for describing it. So what I mean is, is trying to describe the crisis in terms of uh, public versus private power, capitalism versus socialism, rights versus uh, you know uh, the state, you know, individualism versus collectivism, all the sorts of things that in the 20th century we talked about endlessly right? Regulation versus free market, all this kind of stuff. None of it applies, right? It's none of it. Like, it's almost like you have to, you look at the world and you, none of those categories describe what we're seeing, let alone collectively um, or, 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 or usefully analyze what's going on. Um, and, and, and so then, so when you get to that realization, there's, there's actually a very, a very deep philosophical problem there that if the language isn't isn't um, useful anymore for describing it then the language isn't isn't available for reforming it or fixing it Do you see what I'm saying? okay so we have to um we, we, it was really a, a, lar a, lar a large uh, manner a large extent i should say on um, uh, almost an act of desperation to rethink the whole thing so now that was it, coming from a catholic perspective that is not difficult to get going because the church had given us resources in Catholic social teaching in its long history to um, already resources to already begin building a different set of categories or a different set of concepts. Right. So, so instead of talking about sort of formal structures or constitutional structures, for example, which is the modern tendency, we can start talking about things like justice. <laughs> right which is something that that the tradition used to talk a lot about and then we stopped talking about and started talking about things like rights and started talking about um constitutional protections and divisions of power and stuff like that and it's like okay but what about what about justice what about peace what about um the common good what is it what about you know all of these um these 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 more fundamental concepts that you really have to have um, you have to have some sense of what they mean in order to even start building prudential policy recommendations. Right? And it's like it's like in the modern period we had we had um, forgotten. It's like forgetting the fundamental political conversation and just talking about the sort of surface area, surface level. Um, uh, surface level kind of policies or, or, or um, mechanisms of governance rather than talking about like what government is, what is it for, right. who is the human person, right? Okay, so, so we got to go all the way back into that. Um, now, we're not alone. There's a lot of people doing that, right? And from different angles, different directions. Our approach tends to be from the conservative, uh, the conservative sort of Christian side. Um, one of the things that's been really interesting in that endeavor is discovering how many people have already gone down these these paths right discovering um the 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 more old-fashioned conservative movement in the united states you know just discovering um weaver and kirk and and then in england you know discovering the distributists you know uh um, yes already a tradition here that we forgot somewhere around um i don't know 1955 <laughs> right somewhere somewhere at, right after the war in the united states anyway everything became you're either a communist or a libertarian right and and we forgot this whole thick tradition of of western political thought conservative political thought and so bringing all that back 
is a big part of what we're trying to do. Awesome. And yeah. then before we actually delve more into the actual theory and the history and the yeah. the, the, the culture of uh, medieval Christendom, mm -hmm. what is the some of, some of the practical things that you're trying to do? Like, I've been to, out to Steubenville where I guess New Polity is maybe headquartered. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if headquarters is the right word, but mm -hmm. um, what are some of the practical things that they, those people tell you to do that, that you then go do? <laughs> yeah. So the, the main, the most important thing is, is, um, is, is, is understanding the importance of community. And we, people say this. So people are beginning to say this so often that it's becoming, uh, almost, um, a platitude or a cliche, but it's, it's, that's only because saying it, that is that, is that way doing it is not what I mean is, is like, you have to not talk about community, but actually live it. All right. So, um, this is, this is what we're trying to do here. We have, uh, there are, there are many, many families that are here centered around Franciscan university, of course, it's sort of like the anchor, but it's grown way bigger than that. Um, there are, um, you know, you know, many, many families who are on the same page who, uh, so there's just like a massive homeschooling community, really wonderful parishes, several, a couple of them, um, uh, a, a, a revitalization of the downtown areas occurring, which is mostly Catholics with Catholic businesses and that, that are, that are, um, attempting to build the kind of, um, uh, the kind of economy where you have the ownership of productive property that's tied to families, which is tied to communities. Right. And, and so we're really, um, we're really putting a lot of effort in, in, uh, in sort of intentionally living here, right? Like not just, uh, not just happen to be this being the place where we like sleep and eat, but really we live on the internet. It's like, no, like we live here. We get together all the time. We, you know, we, we, we avoid the, the sorts of things that pull people out of their community. Um, uh, as hard as, as strong as we can, we avoid that. And so it's, it's, and it's, it's really going, quite well. And, it, and it's not, um, it's not just because it's kind of quaint. There's actually a, a really, we're, we're convinced there's a radical political thing going on here, which is that, that friendships, real friendships, like structures of friendship, like communities of solidarity are impervious to the threats and promises that, that tyrannical regimes make. This is the reason why from all the way back from Plato, right, that, that we've known that that the path to tyranny always requires the destruction of friends, friendships. And the reason like what Aristotle and Plato both say is this, is that this is not complicated. It's because friends, people who are embedded in networks of friendships aren't afraid, <laughs> right? Like they're not alone. They're not desperate. They're not anxious. They, they feel secure. They have a place they love. Um, and that means that they have a place that they're willing to defend right? That they'll stand up for. So therefore they have courage, right? And all these, all of these traits make them, um, uh, insusceptible to the kind of rule that tyrants, um, to tyrants advance because the tyrant of course has a very limited playbook because he can't, right? Why would you volunteer? Why would one voluntarily obey a man who doesn't have his best interests at heart, right? So the tyrant has a problem. He can't get anyone to do what he says. And so the way he does the way he can do it is through threats um, or promises of reward, right? That's those are the things he has. And if you're if you're happy in your life in your community, then you you don't care about the the promises of rewards. You know, that's mm -hmm. not interesting to you, right? And you have courage, so you'll stand up to the threats. Now, this so so the point is that we we look at the world we're living in, and we think it's not merely that we want to escape it. Um, though I think that's part of it and raise our children someplace safe. It's that, well, how do we resist it? And it's like, well, you don't resist it by, you don't resist it by uh, fighting it on its own battlefield, right? You're not, you don't resist it by, uh, by fighting it in the, the atomized abstract sort of neutral space that it's created. You, you, you fight it by creating totally different spaces, totally different community spaces of interpersonal bonds of interpersonal relationships that are real and therefore strong. Right. And, and that, that's real resistance. So there's a, there's a po certain political radicalism, radicalism to it. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and I think so, so yeah, Steubenville is becoming a place where, where that is going on. Um, 
and like I said, lots of people are moving here. Uh, and, and, you know, it's a little town that's getting bigger in a lot of ways. So there that's you go. That's my answer. No, that's what I hear is like, everyone's moving to Steubenville now. Um, <laughs> and I remember I was there 2022, I think in November and, you know, there was a big, you know, church was filled to the brim. I don't remember what the name of the church was, but beautiful church. And there was some sort of weekend street festival and it was super lively. I was like, oh, yeah. that's great. It's like a nice little downtown. Um, yeah, and that clearly has some history and some roots, and now there's a lot of new energy in it. Let yeah. me bring it or tie it back to these sort of theoretical things that you focus on in your academic work. Mm -hmm. I assume, or how does I guess what you're doing track back to this sort of recovery of an earlier, an older Western political thought? Yeah, well, I think I actually that the, the it, it directly. Okay, so so if you look at um, okay, I'm just going to go real big. Okay. Go for it. <laughs> like real big theoretical. There's, there's many disagreements in political theory. It, it, okay. But, but probably the biggest, maybe the, the, maybe the most foundational that it's so big that it goes unnoticed by, by a lot of people is the question of whether or not the world, whether or not the world, the human world and the world as a whole is is it in, it in its nature chaotic and then put in order by power or if it's in its nature ordered right and then and then disordered by power or by violence okay so is violence the the source of order or is violence the source of disorder right these this is a fundamental disagreement and and you have on the pagan sort of uh, uh, most versions of paganism on the pagan side is the idea that 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 it, it, there's a chaotic cosmos that is then ordered, put into order by the power and the violence of the gods, right? Or of, and then the, the human world is similarly violent and chaotic and then put into order by human power. But that human power then operates underneath the power of the gods and the power of the gods is itself fickle, uh, not necessarily rational, it's often um, um, sometimes just capricious, right? So you have, which which leads down the road of um, to a sort of fatalism sometimes in that kind of worldview. But then also the idea that of the hero of the of like that that glory is that glo heroic glory is this sort of contending with the chaos of the cosmos or contending with the gods and overcoming it, right? Um, and so that becomes sort of the political ideal is that kind of um, that kind of power. So you have maybe an obvious example would be someone like Caesar Augustus, who's who's acclaimed as as the savior, the prince of peace, the one who brought peace to the world. And of course, what what that actually is, is is overwhelming military force. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. That's actually what he brought. He actually it's actually a military um, a, accomplishment, an imperial accomplishment. So that's one sort of approach. But then the Christian approach, which is really a, obviously a development out of the out of the, um, the Jewish, is is no. The cosmos is ordered. The cosmos is structured. The cosmos is is rational because it's created by a rational God, and and it is it is put into um, disorder by violence. Okay, by power, and and that what the sin is what we would call it. And that that disorder then is the object becomes the object of of just political power. So you do what I mean is you're not um, uh, uh, coercion or violence. Warfare is not about conquering the gods and becoming a hero. It becomes about restoring the order that God had already created. So instead of if you think about it, it's like instead of contending up to the against the divinities like the like the pagan hero you're you're contending down against the demonic right like you're destroying that which disrupts the good and and so and so that means that um at least in a sort of military sense the the action of the sword the action of coercion is remedial right you see what i mean like it's um it's uh it's it aims at at structuring a world that would render it unnecessary. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So it's, it's, um, so that, 
and, and the idea there, of course, is that the society itself, then society itself, if the, it is, is in its nature peaceful. So, um, and it, let me put it this way. What it wants to be is at peace, mm -hmm. right? It's the, the, the human beings want, desire friendships. They desire communities of love. They're, they're attempting to build that. That's, that's what it wants. And so the, the, um, it, and that, that is thwarted by sin. So that means that the political power, if it is to attempt to achieve human flourishing, it needs to insert itself into that space in order to do two things. One is to eradicate or eliminate that sin, which is keeping the community from forming, uh, for, for spontaneously coming to peace. And then also leading that community deeper into the peace. Neither of these, this, this is very um, uh, important um, um, theoretically because these, um, this sort of political action, the action of the, of the pre of the, of the princes of the middle ages is um, not the action of a sovereign legislator, not the action of like an emperor who, 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 who positions himself as like a God, right? So it's the source of order, but is rather um, a, a, a servant of order or a servant of the law, you see, rather than the source of the law, which means that at the highest levels, they become a sort of judge. Um, so they're judging based upon the law rather than making the law at the lower levels, they become warriors, say, um, chivalric knights, for example, whose duty it is to serve the true and the good, not who are the sources of the true and the good, which is the way the pagans would be more inclined to, to think of it. Right. So, or the modern Nietzscheans, <laughs> um, so that what I mean is. What I'm trying to get at here is that the you ask the question of how is the medieval world relevant to what we're doing now is it's this idea that that human flourishing or human which is found in friendship and in community does not require it's not does not require the um, the coercive governmental intervention that the pagans supposed was necessary and that the moderns have resupposed is necessary so. If you look at if you look at like the social contract theories and stuff like that, which I am not a big fan of, I know some some conservatives are, but um, it's really it's a, making a similar sort of assertion that the pagan world is making, right? That uh, especially in someone like Hobbes, but even in someone like Locke, that the 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 social world is brought into being by order power, right? The the creation of the government is what creates the social space, right? You you. You, you create the government so that you can have a social space, right? Now that's not medieval, right? The medievals think the world operates almost as the exact opposite. The social space is that which the, any sort of government is instituted to protect. It doesn't, it doesn't generate the conditions of possibility for society. It guards, protects, and advances society. So what we're trying to do here is, is build those communities where we don't need that which is higher than us. We can do it ourselves, right? And um, because it comes out of who we are, it comes out of our natures. Um, so I guess that's the answer to your question. My answer to your question. <laughs> that's okay. great. And, that, and so pushing more here is your book or one of your books is Before Church and State. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of the state is this sort of modern construct, right? Where it's, I'm wondering the state as opposed to what, like what is i guess from what out from out of what does the state emanate as a modern political construct in this sort of whether it's the social contract theory or machiavelli um yeah. and political thought what's the antecedent to that that's a political ordering or a political rendering that you're talking about that's the steward of order peace prosperity justice right virtue the community mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. how does the state sort of distort that? Well, there's, there's so many different ways to answer that, but I, I'll, I'll start with, I'll start with this, that uh, maybe one of the biggest differences, um, uh, yeah, maybe one of the biggest markers of, of the state, the modern state 
is what Max Weber said, which is that that the, the modern state or the state is an entity that has a monopoly on violence in a certain geographical area. Okay. It's a very minimal, minimal definition that gives it no function, right? It's just sort of descriptive. <laughs> okay. But even at that level, say just a monopoly on legitimate violence is what he says. Um, that doesn't exist in the Middle Ages. Okay. So, so, so there's, there's no, and there's no notion that it ought to. So someone like the king does not have a monopoly on legitimate violence. It is not like the nobles beneath him are somehow bearing a commission from him where they gain a right to use coercion or something like that. That's not the case, right? They, they hold their power directly from their position in society, right? Now they may hold certain rights and certain things from the king, but not that not and he's, there's no sense that there's some sort of sovereign commissioning of um, some sort of a monopoly on violence. In fact, that is the whole idea of a closed, that, that idea that there's a monopoly on violence is tied directly to the notion of the state as being a, um, a, 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 a what am I saying, like a hegemonic entity that has a sort of gapless um, network that, in, that at least has an umbrella, a gapless umbrella that covers the entire social space, right? So that you have this one entity, the state that is present everywhere, right? It, even if it's just present everywhere virtually, but it's potentially present everywhere and it, it's rules and it's regulations is what, is what governs the way all the components of society interact with each other. Okay. Now that you think, well, my goodness, that sounds totalitarian. And it's like, well, no, that's also just um, John Locke. <laughs> so like if every interaction is contractual, that means that every interaction involves the two people contracting in the state who enforces the contract, right? The idea is that there's this universal, um, uh, universal monopolization on coercion that is the context in which human society functions. Now, the medievals just don't have that. So they imagine human society, like I said, is functioning according to morals, ethics, um, according to customary law, which the primary or the, 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 mo the, the mode of enforcement in the first instance is at the most immediate level, right? So, um, uh, at the village level, there is police powers, right? And those police powers aren't, aren't delegated to the village. The, the, the village has police powers because it is a social, it is a, a real community. Mm -hmm. right? And so it has the ability to enforce its own customary law, right? Just in the same sort of way that I, as a father, have the ability to enforce the rule in my family, right? And I do against my children, right? I enforce it. And I don't think of myself as somehow bearing a commission or a delegation from the state, right? In fact, I, I, I would laugh at such a notion because I am prior to the state, right? My, my family is. Well, that's the same way the villages are. That's the same way the, 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 um, the different, uh, the, you know, the, the jurisdiction of the local knight, the jurisdiction of the duke, the jurisdiction, these are not, these are not delegations. They're prior to, or, or at least simultaneous to the higher levels of order. Right. You see? So, so there's no, it's a totally different political theory. There's no notion of sovereignty. There's no notion of, uh, of, uh, and there's no notion that there's some sort of a closed realm, right? So if you imagine, if you imagine, um, all these different communities living according to their, their own ways of life, enforcing it at the most immediate level themselves. Um, if conflict breaks out, say between two of these communities, which happens right all the time in the middle ages. Okay. So two villages are fighting with each other or something like that. Okay. Well, what happens? Well, then the higher power has to intervene something higher come, who's higher than both the villages will come in. And and let's say it's the king. So the king comes in because this is conflict. Conflict is bad. We're Christians. We're trying to have a society of peace. So you come in, but it's not like the king comes in and says, I'm going to now enforce my law because I'm the king and I have law, the law code. There is no law code. So he shows up and he says, what's going on here? Right. And he has to figure out, well, who's breaking which rules? How do you guys live over here? Your, what are your rules, village A? What are your rules, village B? When have you guys interacted before? How are this? And then he figures out, he investigates and figures out who's just and who's unjust, not who's broken the law and who's not. There is no law. There is no like statutory law. It's, it's a, it's a question. It's a, yeah. It, yeah it's okay. a question of justice, 
right? Like who's the criminal, meaning who's the sinner, right? And then, and then reestablishing of, of the peace. But so, so making up, forcing them to make amends and to reestablish the peace. But in doing that, there isn't some universal bureaucratic code. There isn't any, you know, the, the, the state is not there. There is no state, right? But there's certainly political power, right? There's certainly political power, but there's no state. Um, so that's now, so the, the, the transition to the state is in the modern period and the creation of the state, right? With, with, the, with the definite article is the process of extending one of those nodes of power, right? Mo in, 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 depending where you are, say in, in continental Europe, it, it's normally the monarchical, um, node of power. Um, extending that to encompass and to absorb all the all the other nodes of power that existed in the pre-modern world, right? So just so the, the creation of absolutism is the, the the attempt at the expansion of the monarchical at the expense of all other power structures. If you but it can happen other ways. If you go to England or something where you have the the period of um, there, there's a competition between whether or not it's going to be the monarchical node of power or it's going to be the parliamentarian right mm -hmm. right and and what so whether it's going to be the middle class or the no or the or the monarchy and um you know as we know ultimately the parliament wins right in that and and so you get a state but it's a parliamentary state but it's no less a state right um both of them are both types then so it doesn't matter what i'm saying is whether or not you have a kind of absolutist um monarchical or if you have the republican parliamentarian thing it doesn't th those those fights that seem so absolute in in a modern context right where we've seen like it, it, you know how, how could you have a more a more fundamental argument it's like well no actually there there is an argument that's occurring within a historical dynamic that they share which is the creation of the mon the the, the uniform homogenous and, and hegemonic state Right? Both of which are, they're both doing that. Um, so, you know, and, and both doing it, the process by which they do it is by the elimination of all other levels of order within society or the rooting of it out, the rooting out of those levels of order. Um, and this is a really interesting thing. I'm sorry, I'm going on and on, but you got me thinking about this. There's like, if you look at someone like John Locke, um, and, 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 and some of your listeners probably know this, that when John Locke's writing the second treatise on government, he's writing it expressly against a guy named Filmer. Mm -hmm. right. And Filmer is the absolutist, right? Defending absolute monarchy. And so when you actually go and read Filmer, <laughs> which, which I recommend everyone does, what you'll find is that he's just as radical as an, uh, of, a, of a, he has just as radical of an individualistic anthropology as John Locke does. So his argument is, that human society is a big sea of individuals who are self-interested and that that's the reason why we have to have a monarchical power that can that can ex come from without and externally structure and unite this big, big sea of self-interested individuals, right? And it's like, and then John Locke, his counter is not, no, 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 society isn't a big sea of self-interested individuals. That's not what he says, right? They actually agree on the, on the, the political substrate and his argument, though, is no, it's not monarchy, but it's the parliament that ought to do that. Right. <laughs> right? So they were actually the, the argument is actually occurring within a more profound agreement. Both of which are against the medieval conception. Right. Gotcha. So, yeah, that's a there lot. Right. That, that's a lot right there. There you go. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I can't help it. <laughs> that how do your students react when you're teaching this sort of political philosophy? Because it seems. I think more complicated than like, right, like social contract theory is intuitive because, or it's, it's, I think maybe liable to be grasped easily because it is sort of intuitive, like a, a kind of basic, more basic paradigm than this very mm -hmm. lived, complicated, maybe a little bit more opaque and mysterious, um, sort of ordering yeah. or structuring of a political or cultural community that existed in Christendom. So how, how do you encourage people to maybe break out of the paradigms that we've inherited to be able to see in this way? Um, what I find is that people are actually very receptive 
and that they they know there's something wrong with the way they've had things explained to them and they don't know what it is and when you and when you when you start explaining it they normally go oh that makes sense i can see now that that's that's right <laughs> you know and 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 the way the, the way i normally go at it is by using a lot of examples from the family a lot and the re like i did a minute ago talking about a father's right to coerce his children right or his ability to do that the reason why is because almost all of us still have experience with the family or um you know if we don't for some tragedy we at least have we at least know what it is right, right. because we it's still a part of our social world the family exists and 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 the, that is the family the dynamic of the family is one of the last holdouts of of this pre-modern understanding of politics right so it's one of the last places where we can see this sort of thing in in, in um this kind of this kind of uh, pre-modern political reality we can see that oh it's actually plausible it's actually credible yeah look you can have people living together who are both have their own interests sort of right but have a greater interest which is the good of the group or the good of each other right or let me put it differently because that sounds too socialistic let let's let's say something like this you can say uh, the common good so I'll try to explain to people what the common good is and and it, it, it to Americans it immediately sounds like we're talking about communism or something right because that's we're trained to think that okay and 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 we have to be careful because we might mistakenly end up talking about something that's, <laughs> that's like that. So, but we're not. So here's how, here's how you, you explain it. You go, well, think about something like, you think about something like a happy family, right? That a happy family is the conditions, um, the, one only enjoys the happiness of a happy family when the other members of the happy family are also enjoying the happy family. What I mean is I can't have enjoy a happy family unless all the other people in my family are happy, <laughs> right? Like we all, we enjoy it together or we don't enjoy, or we don't have it at all. Right. Right. But there's no notion that that happy family is predicated upon my surrender of my own good. It's like, no, it's precisely my happiness that is intrinsic to the happy family. Right. And my wife's happiness and my kids happiness. So I no longer have to see the individual in competition to the group. Right. Like I don't longer have to think, well, is it going to be individualistic or collectivist like Hayek would want me to have? Make, make your pick. Choose one or the other. It's like, no, I choose an understanding of community in which the human person person flourishes in the conditions in which the other human persons are flourishing. Right. That's the common good. Now, I think the family allows us to see that, right? And, and it'll, it, 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 you, you can have, you can actually use the family to discuss um, any number of, of, of difficult concepts, um, concepts surrounding rights, you know, um, private property, especially. So this is another sort of interesting example, right? Because um, uh, in, in the fight between, in the 20th century fight between, um, between liberals and communists or capitalism and communism, whatever, you know, we got this very um, uh, formal and rigid understanding of private property, for example. Okay. So, and, and, and yet the Catholic church, Catholic social teaching, the, the, the whole tradition has always had a much more nuanced and subtle understanding of what private property is and how it works or the right to it. And, and that's often very confusing for people because it, 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 it in America, you start talking about anything that seems to be mitigating against the right to private property and people freak out, right? Because, oh my goodness, you're talking about communism. And it's like, but no, here, let me give you an example, <laughs> right? The example would be something like this. Like I own my house, right? I own it. Okay. I'm on the title. I have legal, uh, legal ownership. I own the couch that's sitting in the living room. All right. It's mine. But if I went home and, um, and, and decided that I wasn't going to let my wife sit on my couch tonight, because it was mine, you know, or, or I made her like ask permission or I said, well, I guess you can sit on my couch tonight, sweetie, you know, or, or I told my kids that I guess I'd let them sleep in the house tonight, but maybe tomorrow I wouldn't. 
right? Because I have a right to private property. We would all think that was very weird behavior, right? We would all think that was very peculiar behavior and very strange and not just that, but inappropriate, like almost right. like, almost like me saying that it's mine to my family is not true. Do you know what I mean? Like, like it's to tell my, right. family, yeah, to tell my family that it's mine, that is not, is like wrong, you know? Okay. And the reason is because I own it for them, right? It, so now, now if I come home from work, and the city is pulled up and is moving my furniture out of my house and just taking it, right? Or something, or my neighbor or somebody's doing that. Then I come up and I go, hey, that's my couch, right? And now I can assert property rights, right? I'm asserting property rights against them. And then I'm, and that doesn't sound strange to us. That sounds appropriate and like true. It is yours. All right. Now, what's the distinction there, right? What's the difference? And it's like, well, the, what we're seeing in that the example is that I is that something like rights, something like a property right is something that I assert against something that has more power than me. Right. So that could be the state. It could be a criminal who has more power than me in, a, in any given instant. Right. I assert it against something that that could take that from me. Mm -hmm. Right. That's more powerful. But it doesn't make any sense to assert that right against people who are weaker than me or dependent upon me, right? That doesn't make any sense because why? Because, well, in the tradition, because I have, a, I have the right against the more powerful people because I have a duty to the people who are weaker than me, right? That's, that's what we're seeing in that situation. Like my, I assert my right so that I can perform my duty, right? right? And that's the reason why it feels so wrong if I assert my right against my children, because it is wrong. <laughs> I only have the right against the city so I can serve my children. All right. Well, when you, that's something that is just common sense. We can see that, but that goes at the, to the very heart of a liberal notion of rights, right? The liberal notion of sort of absolute rights vanish, right? Because rights now become embedded in a society that is actually a very complex hierarchical network of duties, right? And, and your, and your correspondent, your rights correspond to duties and without duties, rights make no sense. Absolutely. Right? So I have a right to free speech only because I have a duty to speak the truth, right? <laughs> I, you know, you see what I'm saying? I have a right to bear arms only because I have a duty to fight for justice. You, you see, there, there's no just sort of where you get to sit back and just enjoy rights, right? That's not the way, that's not the way they work. So now that's very anti-liberal, very, very unlibertarian, right? Profoundly so, but it doesn't have a single shred I don't think there's a single shred of agreement with socialism in that or anything even vaguely left wing. Right. Right? And, and, and really what it is, is pre-modern. It's really what we're talking about is, oh, yeah, that's that's conservative. Like, you know, <laughs> well, because it's, yeah. just it's premised or focused on an idea of the human person. That's not just this sort of automaton that's kind of empty or flat. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I am a human being by virtue of that. I have these various rights with which I get to dispense with them as I please or use them however I want with always the caveat. So long as I'm not doing something to harm anyone else. But when you have yeah. a, a fuller, more capacious view of the human person, how they fit with other human persons in relationship, then that's where all of these duties pop up. And then you see the, the utility and the beneficence that comes from the rights is that sort of. Yeah, exactly. And the other thing that opens up really opens up is the possibility of rights bearing entities that are not individuals. So if, if duties and rights are, are, are tied together like this, then other institutions, you know, the city might, the, 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 you know, the, the parish, the, these things, the, uh, the, the schools, whatever, it doesn't, guilds, it doesn't matter. So various associations, human associations have duties, um, um, obligations, uh, services that they perform and therefore corresponding rights. And those rights aren't granted to them by something higher. Those rights are, are actually the, 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 um, essential flip side of their obligation and justice. You see, so this is the thing. So the idea in the classic, in the classical tradition here, the medieval and Christian tradition is that power, human power is always 
always ought to be ordered towards justice, mm -hmm. right? So it, it always ought to be ordered toward the common good in the sense I described it earlier, not in the sort of socialistic sense, right? And that means that wherever there's power, there's obligations or duties, but that also means wherever there's power, there's rights, right? Because it has a right to perform that duty that service and that so any grouping of human beings as soon as a, gr a grouping of human beings groups together so as soon doesn't matter what it is it'd be a bowling league as soon as we come together as a group we now have power that wasn't there before that then puts upon us obligations of justice which then endows us with rights right that that and that's not and that so now anything that's higher any political authority that's higher than us if it's going to be just must re respect those rights you know, that's now that's, again, totally non-liberal and non-socialistic. Right. The state can't come in and say and you know, break up the bowling league because you're sharing yeah, this exactly. common good of bowling together and, you know, the fun competition <laughs> and friendship and all of those things. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, which is, you know, th this this what I find you're right, it could be complicated. Um, it can be complicated because the modern a lot of modern theory, um, uh, you know, part of the charm of it is that it simplifies things, mm -hmm. right? So, so if you look at something like liberalism, uh, you know, just stereotypical liberalism, where the whole problem of human inequality, the problem that some people are smarter than other people, some people are faster than other people, some people work harder than other people, the whole problem of human inequality is just sort of swept under the rug by having a formal system of equality. Everyone's equal in the law, right? And then we pretend, and you just kind of get to pretend like now human inequality is sort of irrelevant, right? Like, like now it's like, well, that's, we are all equal under the law, you know? And we've, and we've just sort of sidestepped the profound problem, philosophical, social problem of how to make sense of human inequality, right? Or, or, or how, how is that, how do, we, how do we deal with human inequality? Right, which is a fact, right. you know, and this is and this is and this is a fact that you know if you go back to the pagans, it's like well they deal with it with slavery, right? That's what Aristotle. The beginning moves of the politics. It's like yeah, there's powerful people and weak people, and the weak people are slaves. <laughs> okay, and and the liberals, you know, you move forward, and the liberals just sort of pretend like it doesn't exist. Well, the the and the socialists, of course, they, the socialists, of course, see inequality, and then and then their program. Is to is to eliminate it, right? To make everyone actually the same, which is impossible. Okay, but the the old traditional understanding, the old conservative Christian understanding, would be that we don't try to dodge the problem of inequality at all. We you 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 square right up to it and go, well, yeah. There's people are some people are 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 more powerful or are superior in whatever specific. Um, uh, category than other people. That's the context in which justice works. That's the context for gift giving, right? You can't give a gift to someone if you don't have it, you don't have something they don't have, right? You can't, that's the context of the father son relationship. That's the context of the master student relationship. That's the, you know, every relationship where, where every, every relationship that is fruitful is a relationship that is premised upon some inequality. One has something that they're giving to the other and the other has something different that they're giving to that one, right? There's some sort of an exchange that's going on based upon inequality. And so it's not, we're not trying to avoid it. We go, yeah, that's, that's not a, that's not a bug. It's a feature. Sure, right? of course. <laughs> you, and now, and now what we have to do is talk about justice, right? That's the context for which we talk about justice. And, um, so again, this, this is, a, it's, it's profoundly, it allows you, it's more complex than liberalism that just got to pretend like inequality doesn't exist or socialism that just got to pretend like it's always bad, right? It's more complex because we can say inequality is a fact of life. It's inevitable and it's obvious. And now the question is, is it just or is it unjust? And it could be either, right? And sometimes it's just and sometimes it's unjust. Well, that's a more complex problem than either the left or the, or the liberals, right? It's, it, it is a more complex problem, but it's also more obviously, um, true, right? Like <laughs> it seems to me. Yeah. It was more real 
<laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, every We've asked this question a number of times on this podcast. Everyone seems to have, it's almost like a cocktail party trick where it's like, well, here's where it all went wrong. Where do you oh, yeah. pinpoint, like Weaver picks uh, William of Ockham and uh, of course, relativism. Yeah. And then once like with, with Ockham, you can't, once you have nominalism and the sort of the, the, the slow, the quick move to relativism, you actually destroy the common good because there's nothing shared. Mm -hmm. It's this, it's only a mental construct. Um, right. Right. And that's not actually anything that is real, but um, like, where do you see the, how Christendom corrupts or transitions into modernity yeah. with respect to political life? Or do you resist this sort of, well, it's no, just, no, it all starts it's, here. It's, it, it's, it's a hard, the, I mean, it's, it's a hard question for obvious reasons, right? Because history, a, anything that happens historically happened for the reasons that happened, that happened before it, right? <laughs> so you can always push, no matter what you, whatever, what you pick, you can always push further back if you want to. But, um, uh, I think that the story is complicated, obvi obviously very complicated, um, but uh, I would I would I want to start telling the story in the 14th century, similar to Weaver. I wouldn't focus so much on nominalism, though I think nominalism is important. I, I'm I'm much more interested in the fragmentation of Christendom into what will become national churches and national um, uh, regimes, eventually states after 1648, after the Westphalia. Um, and, but even then, even when you tell that story, which is important, right? You're talking about the story of the, the elimination of the universal and the, the restructuring of Christendom into, um, particulars, particular kingdoms that are no longer bound together in some sort of universal conception of order. Obviously that's, profoundly important the, the problem with it is 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 that the life of the actual people right so if you like you, you we talk about all that and we end up talking about political theory and war and high politics and that's all true right but the actual peasant out in the countryside of france right out in the middle of nowhere 200 miles from paris right their life wasn't really different if we're talking about 1500 or you're talking about 1700 Do you know this 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 like the, the, they're still catholic they're still living in their community their life is still based primarily on custom their life is still based primarily on their relationships with each other it's still right you so so it's it's dangerous to focus all your all of our thinking on those kind of high structures right. and not seeing that there was a, a deeper substrate of Christianity that lingered much longer than that, right? And and actually kind of provided, I think, the stability on which those kind of games could be played by the elites. And I and I and I and, and so when I then correct myself by saying that, then I want to say, okay, well, when did that change? And that has to be the Industrial Revolution. You know, the Industrial Revolution. You know, when when that way of life was was finally undone, but it wasn't even, I mean, that took a hundred years. It wasn't until the 20th century that it's finally definitively undone. Right. You know, <laughs> sure. and so, and, and that, I think that destruction, um, of the old, of that old, that old way of living and the replacement with the modern. So that means with the technocratic, with the bureaucratic, with the administrative, with the industrial, the state, the militaristic it's like it achieves completion at the moment in which it destroys itself which is the second world war <laughs> do you know what i mean it's like it's like it it, it can't actually survive right and so it so it, it it there that 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 culmination um yeah i mean i i think that's what i would want to say is something like that but it's but it's weird for us as Americans because we're not really a part of that story, right? I mean, we split we split off earlier, and then um, and then lingered in our Christianity for longer than Europe. You know, so we show up. I mean, you think about world the twentieth century. This is a 
It's like Europe's apostasy from Christianity culminates in the Second World War, right? Okay, and, and the radical ideologies and, and the, the, the civil war, European civil war that's just dis civilization destroying civil war, basically. And, and then, but we show up, right? We show up from, you know, from over the sea out there, we show up with a, with a, with a different historical trajectory and, 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 and then to end that war and extend this sort of umbrella of American um, stability, right? And in, in American um, values, which are really, which were still more Christian, more significantly Christian than what Europe in the 1930s was like. You see what I'm saying? And so, and so you have this historical anomaly where, you know, where, where it's like the, 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 the cultural inertia of Christianity gets a second wind because of America's emergence onto the world scene. Right. And, and, um, but now that's petering out. Yes. Right. Right. That's petering out and there's no one to come save us. Right. <laughs> Yeah. So I don't know. I, I guess I guess I try to answer the story something like that. So even even in the United States, I think it's the second half of the 20th century. There's still there's still a a Christian drag, you know, a Christian inertia in it. Yeah. Yeah. It's only till very recently where, yeah. you know, we move into I think Aaron Wren calls it the negative world, which is his yeah. book coming out. And it's based on, I think, the first things piece and uh, where. Now it's really, it's, and it's not just, the inertia is not just petering out, but there's a very concerted effort to undo this sort of pre-modern vestige of um, mm -hmm. political or of a civilizational consciousness that's explicitly or, or even implicitly Christian and based on Christian ideas um, and Christian yeah. conceptions of justice, the human person, civilization. Yeah, politics. I mean, it has been very recently. I think it's, it, I think it has to do um, I mean, I don't mean to be too reductionist, but at least a significant portion of it has to do with the Cold War and that when, as long as the United States was engaged with the communists, then our Christianity was, shoot, sorry, <laughs> My, our, as long as we were engaged with the communists, our, um, our Christianity was, was an integral aspect of our identity, right? Like they were the atheistic communists. We were the, the God-fearing good guys. Do you know what I mean? And like, yeah. and I don't mean that cynically. I mean, that actually having that kind of um, identity is, is actually a, an important motivator towards making it true. Do you know, <laughs> like we're the Christian good guys, so we're going to be Christian good guys. And, and um, having that end, because if you look at the statistics, 1991, the Soviet Union falls, and it, it really is like the, the, the 80% of Americans that self-identify as Christian just falls off a cliff. Right from that, from like that moment on. Now it's also the internet and other stuff that happened at that same moment. But yeah, yeah, all things sort of happening at once. Well, we've gone way yep. over the time we normally do, but this has been so much fun. I've got okay. one more question for you. Okay. You mentioned somewhere in our conversation, I don't remember exactly where, that you're focusing on, or this this, this sort of vision that we're trying to recover is both pre-modern, pre-liberal, but also in a set, interesting respect, it's post-liberal. Um, mm -hmm. But there are various different strains of post-liberal thought, and I'd be. Where do you? How does you? How, how do you? How does New Polity, um, insofar as you have this sort of shared view, orient itself in our contemporary, I guess, movement where these conversations are being had? And I don't. I guess I'm not asking you to necessarily throw punches at the other people. But um, yeah, where are some, yeah. where, I guess, where do you I know draw your I lines? I yeah. Um, well, yeah, we are, the way I guess we would describe it is, it, it, like you said, there's many different sort of factions. <laughs> it's so funny. There, there's the, the, the partisanship of radicals are the, are, it's like the most, um, it's, someone said something about that, about like the communists, right? That they hate each other more than they hate the capitalists. But, um, uh, we are, and I am, like I've made clear today, an, an anti-statist, right? I, I think the, the modern state is 
integral to dechristianization. I think the modern state was the create was created to destroy the church. <laughs> okay. And to replace the church with itself. So I don't have a lot of interest or sympathy with the post liberals whose post liberalism consists in statist authoritarianism, right? Which is a lot of people who call themselves post liberals <laughs> right. or, or they think what makes them post liberal is that they like the state, right? It's like, they used to, they used to, you know, conservatives used to not like the state. And then it's like, oh, look at, we like the state that makes us post-liberal or something. Okay. So that is, um, not something that I or my friends are interested in. We're much more interested in, in, uh, in, in subsidiarity. The idea of, like I was talking about, um, earlier today, the idea of hierarchies of power and, um, uh, of socially embedded power, but power that's embedded in social hierarchies and is not concentrated in any given place. And um, that is both not liberal, right? Um, so it's not individualistic. It's not based on individual rights. It's not based on a social contract theory. It's not based on rule of law in the sense of there being a universal sort of abstract law code. So it's not liberal. So it's post-liberal in that sense, but it's not in any way statist or, or, um, uh, or authoritarian. It's not, it's not impressed with the power of the state. In fact, it views it as um, uh, in, inherently tyrannical. Um, so that I think now, now where we have a lot of similarity with the, the more statist post liberals would be one, the importance of, of religion. So I think that we, we share profoundly in understanding that Christianity is not some private affair, but Christianity is integral to political order itself. Um, all religion is, but Christianity being true <laughs> is the one that is most important. Um, and then, uh, so we share that profoundly. We share also the idea that the the public-private distinction, is insofar as politics versus economics is concerned, is mis is a is a mistaken and flawed distinction. That economic power is still power. Political power is that the the, the the distinction between the two break down. Um, and so questions of justice apply not only to political and actors, but also economic actors. Right. Okay. So that among libertarians, we get, because among libertarian minded people will get sometimes mistaken as being like social justice left, left because of that. Right. But that's a mistaken read, of course, but that's the, that's the read I would expect them to make of us. Um, yeah. So, so. Yeah, I, I think an emphasis on subsidiarity, an emphasis on the local then because of that, right? We get accused of being localist. Some of our our, um, our adversaries refer to us as hobbits, <laughs> which I think they think is a bad thing. But I, <laughs> right? But um, uh, that's also not fair, but it's nevertheless funny. So it's fine with me. Um, yeah, so the emphasis on, on the local, uh, on the on the interpersonal, as opposed to the abstract, I, I think is one of the defining features, definitely. Gotcha. And look, I'll put my cards on the table. I write for the American post-liberal, which is sort of yeah. toys with various aspects and how state power could be used towards achieving mm -hmm. this or recovering this sort of uh, more conservative, common good centric um, mm -hmm political rendering. So I, th this can be our, where we wrap up. I just want to hear your okay. response to like, cause I would love to return to a more subsidiaristic conception of politics, a more local conception of politics. And I think, you know, my read of the current state of things is that a lot, I mean, there's, there is the state problem where the state is, you know, too large, but not only just in terms of size, but also what it's designed to do and how it orders mm -hmm. itself is it's both unaccountable to actual people living in these sorts of communities. Um, and then, but it also it directs other very powerful economic institutions, you know, huge companies, multinational companies that mm -hmm. have tremendous power. And it's not just, they have a lot of money, but they also they actually own like the means of production. They get to decide how, um, how is created, marketing, what is created. Marketing controls people's values. Yeah. Marketing, I mean, the media, I mean, it's, all it's these unbelievably things. unbelievably powerful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So my sort of thing is in order to actually really at, at scale and at an economy of scale, maybe this is 
a, a problem, um, you know, terminologically speaking, but to even have a widespread return to a lot of these things requires something to push back against these large things, these large powerful entities that are crushing um, communities and destroying communities slowly but surely through various policy proposals and propaganda and things of that sort. And I yeah. think then that sort of militates in an argument towards, um, I guess one solution is creating this very strong intentional community, which I think is great. Um, and then I think another one to help aid that process is um, a countervailing power to, and I just, what would you, what would, as a closing thought, what I, would you I, say? Listen, I, I, I would say if it were possible, sign me up, right? Like if, like if we, if, 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 if people could get control of the state in order to use it to destroy the conditions of possibility for the state, I would be all for it. Right. Like, like if that, if that, were, if that were possible and to the extent that it's possible, I support it. This is one of the funny things about, about, um, some of the, I don't even know what to call them. I, I call them status post-liberal. So I don't know how to, else to talk about it, but, but, but is that I suspect that most of their policy recommendations would be recommend, it would be thing I, I, things that I would uh, support, right? Like I would say, yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. If we can do it. What I, I but I question its possibility. Okay. I, I think that there's a, there's, um, I think that the problem is this, or there's multiple problems, but the main problem I would see it is this, that the, I would describe our regime that we're under as an oligarchy. Okay. And an oligarchy is, is precisely the, um, the, is precisely the convergence of the economic and the political, both economic and political power, or the, another way of maybe saying it would be like the ordering of political power to the economic. Yeah. Okay. So there, um, and in the hands of, the class that is amassing the wealth. Okay. And so I'm not the idea. So this oligarchy that we have, it's not simply that there's economics factors that are out of control, economic companies and all that kind of stuff. Like you were saying, the economic, the, the corporate economic actors are not, it's, it's only a fiction, a legal fiction that sees us as distinct from the political entity. Yeah, they go together. The political entity and the economic entity are one thing. And that's literally one group of people. They all marry each other and they're all friends and they move from one board to the next. It's the same power structure. Right. Right. Okay. So, and that power structure grew up together and it always has. So if you're looking at the Soviet Union, it's basically the same thing. If you're looking at communist China, it's basically the same thing. If you're looking, so the, the, what I'm saying is the, the construction of the state as the, the massive sort of administrative state and the construction of the massive capital corporate interests and, their in, and the, 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 the historical phenomenon of those two constructions is one thing and always has been. So I question... I question the possibility of divorcing them, right? I, it sounds to me like if what we're talking about is we're going to create, we're going to somehow get control of the state a, as something separate from that corp and economic thing, and then, and then regulate it. We're talking about civil war. You're talking about what you're talking about is creating a rival oligarchic class or a rival elite class, right? Who's somehow going to re why not get control of the whole thing? <laughs> I mean, like, what do you mean? Why, why would we just try to get, it doesn't, I find it to be, um, I think that the, I think it would be more feasible to talk about a full revolution and overthrowing the entire thing is more feasible than talking about getting control of the state and turning it against the corporate interests. I, I actually, I actually think that's like a more feasible option. Gotcha. <laughs> now that said, I'd be happy. I would be happy to, um, I would be happy to support anyone who has the, who has the power to, to regulate injustice. Sign me up. All right, cool. Well, on that note, this has been a blast. Um, okay. and definitely a sign of things to come for the honors conference. And, um, yep. so yeah, this is fun. Looking forward to, to August and just a few months. Um, it'll be here before Me we too. know it, but if, yeah. so thanks for joining, uh, very glad we got to have this lengthy discussion. If people want to follow more of your work or you, you know, we'll put, uh, a link to before church and state, 
um, and we'll find a publisher that's not Amazon, so it's more local, and uh, you can buy it that New way. New Polity sells it. Oh, good, perfect. We'll we'll put the link there, and you can buy it from New Polity. Yeah. What else should people look for of your work or? Of so work I, of New I have Polity? another book called um, I have another book called The Two Cities. It's a history of Christian politics that goes from the from like Adam and Eve till today. So that's another book um, that's out there. Um, and then New Polity, there's a lot of articles and stuff that I've written. Um, almost all of it's available through New Polity. So newpolity.com is the website. Excellent. Um, yeah, that's it. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you've enjoyed this episode, be sure to check out our website at isi.org resources to see all that we offer our members including the Intercollegiate Review, Select Modern Age articles, debates, lectures, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we will see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.